Good evening, all, and thank you for joining us. My name is Eric Walker, and I'm the president of the Michigan Law Federalist Society. Our chapter is honored to host this eighth episode of the Challenges to Originalism series. For 10 consecutive Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern, the student division has hosted an interview between a rotating chapter president and originalism expert, Professor Lee Strang. Each discussion outlines one of the top 10 most common criticisms of originalism coming from both the right and the left and responds to some of the legal theory's most formidable foes. A live audience Q&A will follow. Today's challenge is, is common good constitutionalism superior to originalism? All audience members should feel free to submit questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom. Now to in introduce our expert. Professor Lee Strang is the John W. Stokler Professor of Law and Values at the University of Toledo. He was appointed the founding director of the Institute of American Constitutional Thought and Leadership in 2023. Professor Strang was previously a visiting professor at Michigan State University of College of Law, which we forgive. He's <laughs> at the University of Iowa College of Law and Harvard Law School. Professor uh, Strang clerked for Judge Alice M. Batchelder on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals and practiced law at Jenner and Block. Professor Strang has been a visiting professor at Georgetown Center for the Constitution and at the James Madison Program at Princeton University. A prolific scholar, Professor Strang has published dozens of articles on constitutional law and interpretation and religion and the First Amendment. His most recent book, Originalism's Promise, A Natural Law Account of the American Constitution, is the first book-length natural law justification for originalism. He's currently editing the third edition of his casebook, The Federal Constitutional Law, and recently finished a book on the history of Catholic legal education in the United States. Thank you again for joining us, Professor Strang. Any introductory remar remarks before we jump into the common good? Yeah, th thanks for your, your introduction, Eric. This is one of my favorite topics. It's one that uh, when Professor Rubio first published his essay back in 2020, I, I've been following the developments of common good constitutionalism. It's been it's been really interesting, the developments. It's been actually, I think, a really healthy conversation within originalism as well. So this is going to be a great event tonight. Yeah, yeah, certainly live. And uh, I think chapters around the country have been discussing it this year. Uh, maybe you could start just by kind of defining the territory. What is common good constitutionalism? Yeah, I had mentioned earlier that there was an essay published by Adrian Vermeule, professor at Harvard Law School, and, and mostly known for his excellent scholarship in administrative law. He published an essay in 2020 uh, outlining or previewing this idea of common good constitutionalism, distinguishing it from originalism was one of the moves uh, at the genesis of the project. And then in 2022, Professor Vermeule published uh, a book by the same name. It was, it was a promise book. Uh, it's been the subject of a lot of reviews, a subject, a lot of uh, debate and conversation. Uh, I think if if our audience is looking for things to read about common good constitutionalism, I think Professor Vimeo's book, Common Good Constitutionalism, is, is good. I think a series of joint articles authored by Professor Vimeo and Professor Connor Casey, his oftentimes co-author, are also a good source of information about CGC. And then lastly, there was a symposium published by the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy in late 2023 that has essays by both proponents of CGC, critics of CGC, 
and then a response by Professor Ramil. So I think that's a place where you can get the kind of state of the art of the debate in this area. So, so what is CGC? I think CGC has kind of two basic commitments. So one commitment is to what the authors call the classical uh, legal tradition or CLT. And I think that's a, a label for the natural law tradition or other people would call the natural law tradition. It stretches back through Rome to the Greeks. Uh, it's, it's a natural law theory of law. So we diff typically distinguish between natural law theories of law and legal positivism. And the natural law theory of law will say that the posited legal materials that are created by uh, Ameri by humans, such as the Constitution, they are part of the law, but the posited legal materials don't exhaust the concept of law. And so you have other non-posited and often non-human created legal norms, like a norm of justice, that would be part of what the law is. So that's, that's this backward looking part of CGC. It comes from the Western tradition, came through Europe, and one of the claims made by proponents of CGC is that the, the American legal system was at, at its founding and ratification and then continuing through today, you have to kind of look a little bit hard for it. But, and, and the authors of the different pieces of work do try to find evidence of the continuing influence and foundational nature of the classical legal tradition in, in our legal system. And then the last move, and I think really in some ways the most important move in our debates over CGC and originalism is well, what, what role does the common good, which is the, the label for the movement, what role does that play? And I think it plays two roles. One role is a justificatory role, which is that the justification for positive human law, the, the justification for the interpretation of positive human law is that it advances the common good of the American political community. And then relatedly, it's that in the process of interpretation itself of the Constitution's different provisions, interpreters must rely on the propositions of the classical legal tradition, including what's going to advance the common good, to help them understand and interpret the law. And, and their claim, I think, is very powerful, which is that one can't actually understand what the law is, the positive legal materials, unless one understands the common good and uses the common good to interpret and apply those, those, those legal materials. So I think that's the, the genealogy and some of the key positions of it. Yeah, very helpful. So from that foundation, what, what are some of the critiques or claims that common good constitutionalism brings against originalism? Yeah, and, and this is one of the reasons why when the essay was first published by Professor Vermeule and then the book, I, I was and continue to be very interested in it because many of Professor Vermeule's premises, so such that there is a natural law tradition, uh, the natural law tradition was a part of the American legal system. I wholeheartedly agree with all those propositions. And so I've been really interested to see what, if anything, of substance is difference between CGC and originalism, especially from a natural lawyer's background or natural lawyer's perspective. And so far as I can tell, and the reason why I'm being a little bit hedgy is that I've honestly had a little bit of a hard time identifying the bases from the perspective of CGC itself, how it's different from originalism. And, and one of the reasons is Professor Vermeule, for example, in his work, and then Professor Casey in his work, both affirm propositions that are core parts of originalism. Uh, one proposition is what we call the fixation thesis, which is that the Constitution's meaning was fixed uh, when the Constitution was ratified, this positive legal document. And that for the most part, they're a little bit cagey on how much, if uh, to what extent, uh, the, the CGC proponents seem to suggest that uh, judges should follow the Constitution's original meaning, maybe at least prima facie, or maybe even in the majority of instances. So there's actually a lot of overlap between some, some parts of CGC and originalism. I think the CGC folks have three main criticisms of originalism as I understand their position. The first is kind of a global criticism, that there's a lot of times where the proponents of CGC will characterize originalism as, they'll, they'll use adjectives, fundamentally positivist or legal positivist. And I think that's supposed to have a, a term, would be a term of a program, that's supposed to be a negative comment. And especially from somebody from that perspective who claims that natural law is the best way to understand the legal system and, and law in, in general. And I think, and there's a way in which that criticism is certainly true, right? That originalism focuses a lot on the positive legal materials. And so, so originalism from their perspective is legal positivism all the way down. And therefore it's missing two key points. One key point is that if originalism is supposed to be true to itself, they would say, it needs to recognize that at the framing and ratification of the constitution, the natural law tradition was a huge part of that worldview. And then what arguably, this is their, their argument, was an assumption of the framers and ratifiers when they drafted and wrote and then ratified the uh, the U.S. Constitution. So originalism is misunderstanding its own uh, its own focus, right? It's not it's 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 losing the 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 ability to see this natural law tradition. 
But then there are two related interpretive arguments as I understand CGC. So one related interpretive argument, which I think is the more robust one, is that at different points, Professor Vermeule and other proponents of CGC will argue that uh, interpretation is, quote, necessarily or, quote, inherently normative. And I, I think what they mean is that there's never a situation where a legal official can look at the posited law of a legal system and using just the posited legal material, so it could be the text, structure, history, and precedent, just that, and come up with a determinate legal answer. I think they mean that that's not a, a theoretical possibility, that there always has to be the possibility and the resort to legal norms that aren't themselves directly recognized, adopted by the positive legal materials. And the second related, maybe it's a slightly narrower argument, and this is an argument that comes from the, from the legal philosopher uh, Ronald Dworkin, maybe the most prominent legal philosopher in the Anglo-American world in the late 20th century. Um, Ronald Dworkin had this famous argument, primarily in Law's Empire, book in 1986, where he argued that the best interpretation of any of the law generally, but of any particular area of law, is the, the moral principles that fit that area of law and that, that best justify that area of law. And so from the Dworkinian perspective, you always have access to moral norms because those are the moral norms that fit and justify the area of law. And the way it works in CGC is the claim that the Constitution's original meaning is, I think they want to say always, but I'll just maybe hedge a little bit and say almost always, or for the important provisions, always abstract. And so that from CGC's perspective, to, uh, to understand what these abstract moral norms mean, one has to have resort to those moral norms themselves. And so they rely on this level of generality argument by, from Professor Dworkin to say that the Constitution's original meaning is an abstract moral norm, and therefore that's how, uh, how uh, interpreters should utilize it. And, and what that means is that the original meaning isn't really doing any work in that analysis. What's doing all of the work analytically in the interpreter's mind are the abstract moral norms themselves. So I, I think that's, so there's a, a global argument, and then there's kind of, I think, two concrete examples or instantiations of that argument for the criticism. Yeah, so uh, positivism, the, the fact that interpretation is itself moral and the level of abstraction to, to moral norms. How, how have originalists in turn responded to those, those attacks, both global and the, the more specified? Yeah, the global one is one, there's a way in which it's true, but also not true to the point that the, the critics want, to, want, to, want to, uh, to advance it. So there's a way in which originalism is positivistic in the sense of it's saying that there is fixed law, that's the fixation thesis, from a particular time period when the Constitution's text was adopted, and that there's the constraint principle, and officials today should follow that fixed original meaning. And those are all kind of in the realm of legal positivism in the sense of we're looking for what the positive legal materials require of us, but it's not a deep fundamental legal positivism, or at least it doesn't have to be. And I think, you know, in thinking of the different original scholars that are out there, I don't know if many, if any of them are deep, uh, like theoretical, th theoretical legal positivists. Maybe a good example, uh, somebody who actually has written a review of uh, Professor Vermeule's book is Professor Randy Barnett from the Georgetown, Georgetown Law Center. Uh, his, he, he is somebody who believes in natural rights. His argument in favor of originalism is one that, that leverages the existence of natural rights. And so it's just really hard to characterize somebody like Professor Barnett as a legal positivist. And, and there's a lot of folks out there, myself included, who are fundamentally natural lawyers and who use the natural law tradition as a justification for originalism, but also as tools of interpretation in specific ways and specific areas, and not in a kind of a global way. And so, and when you, and so, just maybe kind of in a concrete way, Eric, what are the ways in which natural law can play a role in originalism, which would dispute the proposition that that originalism is is positivistic? It, it would play it would play, I think, four different roles. So one would be that sometimes the original meaning can itself incorporate natural law norms. I think the word cruel is an example of that. So the original meaning of cruel would be disproportionate to a crime. That would be a, a proposition of justice. Second, if the original meaning is underdetermined, and so there's creativity in the in relevant interpreter about how to implement that, that original meaning, one of the aspects or one of the tools that an interpreter could use, originals dispute to what extent this can be used, would be natural law propositions. Third, when evaluating existing non-originalist precedent, some originalists, myself included, have argued that judges should take into account, among other things, the justice or lack of justice of a non-originalist precedent. And then fourth, 
the justification for originalism in many originalist views is based on natural law propositions. There's actually a group of scholars, you might call them the natural law originalists, Joel Elisea from CUA, Jeff Pojanowski from Notre Dame, and Kevin Walsh from CUA and myself are, are folks who have used the natural law tradition to argue for, to understand originalism uh, in, in kind of an, in a deep way. Uh, and so and so there's there's a lot of permeability, the point is, between originalism and natural law. Now, a, a critic like Professor Vermeule might, Vermeule might say, well, what, what Strang and these other folks are doing is a limited use of natural law and only where the positive law warrants it. And I think there's some truth to that. But, but, but the point is that both the justification and the usage of natural law in originalism by these natural law originalists is not a deep commitment to legal positivism. It's a claim that the legal system itself within the natural law tradition has made a series of what are, are called determinatios. They're, they're, they're prudential judgments about about to what degree, if any, should first order natural law reasoning play a role in the legal system. And the claim by natural law originalists, including myself, is that it should play not a zero role, but not an extravagant role either, not the role that CGC says it should play. And then when it comes to the interpretation cr criticisms, I think there's kind of an easy way to evaluate that. So, so you've had constitutional law, uh, most of our audience has had constitutional law. You know, one way to, to test this is, I think it's really an empirical question. Go and read you know, some of the scholarship on the original meaning of a constitutional provision. So read the original meaning. You know, I'd read Randy Barnett's book. I would read, uh, there's an article by Richard Epstein from the 1980s called Commerce. Read a couple pieces of scholarship and they'll go to the history. They'll, they'll purport to provide the original meaning of the word commerce and then decide for yourself, is it determinate? Maybe not all the time, right? That's not the claim by originalism. But, but the key point is, are there easy cases where the positive legal materials by themselves provide a determinate answer to that case? And I think the answer is clearly yes, at least for some cases. And my argument would be for many cases. And so if that's true, what that suggests is that originalism is able to do what it says it can do, which is answer legal questions by resort only to the positive legal materials and that you don't have to have resort to natural law. There's one other point I would make, Eric, and, and, and that would be, I actually think from the natural law perspective itself, that the claim that all interpretation is inherently normative doesn't get the natural law tradition right. And, and here's why. So, so think about what, what the natural law tradition is saying to do. It's saying fundamentally that people in a political community should pursue the common good together. They should live in relative peace. They should coordinate their activities. And the common example is, is highway regulations. There's not a natural law way of driving on the roads, but to live in a healthy modern society, you have to be able to drive on the roads with relative peace and coordination. And so, and so what you need is detailed positive law norms that describe how people should work together on the roads, which side of the road you should drive on, what the speed limit should be, et cetera. And if the CGC folks are right, it means that at every instance of interpretation by a judge, by a lawmaker, by a driver, they have to ask themselves, well, it seems like I should be driving 55, but is that really the just outcome? And so if the point of, of, of positive law is to implement, make determinatio of the natural laws, to specify it, the CGC position, I think, actually fundamentally at the heart of the, where the legal system meets the road undermines the goal of the natural law view of the positive law system by making it so that people actually can't coordinate their activities. So I think there's actually a really deep jurisprudential reason why that view of interpretation is not right. Yeah, interesting. I, the, 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 a very clear law, like a speed limit, I, I think is a helpful detail to go to for that, that, that point of interpretation. And, and maybe we could do something similar on the overall approach to, to interpreting the law. You know, are there, are there cases that you could point to that you think are, are good watershed uh, dividers between CGC and originalism? Yeah, I, I want to answer that question, but I, I thought your your example about the speed limit is, is a great one, right? So so think about the speed limit. So our legal system, what it what it does is it says, I think in a relatively determinate way, there's a big sign that says 55 miles an hour, and most people know what that means, and we don't need to resort to normative legal reasoning. But there actually are situations where a legal system recognizes the capacity of individuals to use their normative legal reasoning. So for example, let's say that somebody is in the midst of giving birth, right? They got to get to a hospital and, uh, and the speed limit would limit their ability to get there on time. Our legal system actually has built into it mechanisms by which people are able to take into account their own justification and say, in this circumstance, I'm going to drive above 55 miles an hour. It doesn't make it legal, right? But what it does is it means that the law enforcement officer, the executive officer, that person's not going to give a speeding ticket. The prosecutor, not going to give a speeding ticket. 
the jury not going to convict. So my point is that there is determinate law, and there are ways in which our system has built into it, I think very prudently, ways to exercise justice, in this case we would say equity, ways to exercise equity, but in a way consistent with recognizing that the speed limit of 55 miles an hour, it's fully determinate. We don't need natural law to understand what it means. So I think that's just a great example. So when it comes to the cases, I, I would say one of the maybe challenges or criticisms of the, the CGC literature is that it hasn't been uh, big on concrete, on, on, under, on giving information about the concrete meaning of the Constitution, whatever that may be from their perspective. And you know, I, I think you know, this is an area where there's a real contrast with originalism because there's some originalists like myself who do a lot of theoretical work. I also write original meaning interpretation work as well. So one of my areas is what's the original meaning of the word religion? In the First Amendment, I've got a series of three articles. I try to argue using all the tools of originalism what that was. And lots of originals spend their entire careers focusing on the original meaning of different provisions of the Constitution in very concrete ways. And I actually come up with, I think, some very surprising, interesting, and often counterintuitive results. But the CGC folks have been a little bit light on what does what do different parts of the Constitution mean. In some of the areas where they ventured to have uh, statements about the meaning of the Constitution, I've been, I think, received underwhelmingly. I'll just give you one example. I'll give you two examples, actually. So one example is um, Professor Vermeule in his book, Common Good Constitutionalism, is looking for arguments, is identifying, this is his perspective, is identifying aspects of the Constitution that he says support the claim that the Constitution was made with a background of common good constitutionalism. And he points to Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1, which has the taxing and spending clause, and Congress can tax and spend for the, quote, general welfare. And he spends two paragraphs, only two paragraphs, uh, uh, to support the what I think is an assertion that that's a part of the Constitution that authorizes the federal government to have a police power. Now, uh, Richard Primus, one of your professors at Michigan, is the leading scholar on the proposition that there is no principle of limited enumerated powers. Professor Primus is, I think, in the process of publishing a book. It's hundreds of pages of long, right? It's a powerful book, well argued, right? Not, it's not, I'm not, my point isn't to get into the merits of that. But to make that argument, you gotta, you got to spend hundreds of pages. You can't do two, two paragraphs to, to get to that argument. Professor Vermeil, at the end of his book, CGC, does have a series of, of examples that he uses to try and exemplify what his, uh, how, his, how his theory would play out. And I, I actually think the most informative is not really a case, Eric, but it's actually his description of the administrative state. So Professor Vermeil begins the last chapter of CGC, which I think is titled Applications, uh, with a description of the administrative state. And the administrative state, it, he characterizes as, quote, the living voice of law. And so that's an interesting perspective by the administrative state that it's the oracle. It's, it, I think it's another way to characterize it. It's the oracle of law. So what makes it the oracle of law? Two, two key things. So one is that administrative law, both the APA and then the statutes that the agencies are implementing are relatively indeterminate. And so therefore the agencies have a lot of discretion. So that's one key point. Second, what role is there for, for other official oversight of the administrative agencies? It's minimal in Professor Vermeule's view. So Professor Vermeule is a fan, for example, of the Chevron Doctrine. And so, so I think that perspective of the administrative, age, of the administrative state as, as the, the, the entity that is creating the specific norms by which the natural law is implemented and for which other officials have relatively limited role in oversight of that is a metaphor for his view about constitutional interpretation, which is it's relatively open-ended, that there's direct resort to natural, natural law norms to specify the, the, the meaning of those open-ended constitutional provisions. So I think those are, those are two ways in which I think give us some insight into uh, how CGC folks view uh, the Constitution and how would originals view that differently? That, that, that for, the, for the original scholar, as I, as I mentioned earlier, it's an empirical historical question what the original meaning of a particular provision is. And so scholars spend a lot of time debating the original meaning of commerce or privileges and immunities or equal protection of the laws. And, and there's entire literatures that have developed in these debates. And, and, and the, the literatures actually become kind of complicated, but kind of um, detailed, sophisticated, uh, which is a vice in some ways, but actually a virtue because what happens over time is that these scholars identify areas of agreement. Yeah, we agree the original meaning is this, areas of agreement about where they disagree. We disagree about whether it's X or Y. And then there's some areas of continuing uh, disagreement about where there's disagreement, but that tends to become smaller over time. And so you see this really rich scholarly community in the originalist world working out the details of originalism, how it's practically implemented. 
in a way that at least so far we haven't seen in the CGC world. I, I want to circle back uh, perhaps to your first, the, the first general critique that you outlined from CGC scholars against originalism. And, and I think one of the, an originalist instinct is to ask, despite what we might want it to be, what is the system that we have inherited? What is the system of law in which we live? Okay. And are, are there signals that you find at the founding that show that the founders anticipated or designed a system in which law would be interpreted in, according to its original meaning rather than to a a, a moral perspective or, or common good constitutionalism? Okay, that's a great question because one of the debates between originalism and CGC is, or at least I think CGC folks think it is, uh, which which theory of interpretation is more faithful to the circumstances and views of the framers and ratifiers? So I, I want to acknowledge that point. I have just one kind of caveat, which I think it's the case. I, I actually don't understand this debate. I think it's the case that the framers and ratifiers could have thought that there were no sound reasons to follow the original meaning, or they could have thought there are no sound reasons to follow CGC. But if we today think that there are sound reasons to follow one or the other, then we should follow which ones we think there are sound reasons for. So I think there's a way in which this kind of an, that this debate's a little bit orthogonal. But putting that aside, that when I look at the scholarship on the framing and ratification, especially focused on what were the expectations regarding how the provisions would be interpreted, the methodology of the interpretation, the, the two works that have been influential in my, in my view and I offer it to the audience, one is by Christopher Wolf, The Rise of Judicial Supremacy, and the other is by Jonathan O'Neill, uh, Originalism in Politics and Law, I think is the title of it. And, there, and the one book is a little bit older than the other, that both of them purport to go through the, the circumstances contemporary before, during, and after the framing ratification to see how did Americans at that time view legal interpretation. And I'll just give you one kind of data point on that. Both of those scholars, and I've been persuaded by this, point to William uh, Blackstone, whose commentaries, of course, were very influential at the time. And Blackstone had articulated in the commentaries, in the kind of the beginning part of the commentaries, what he described as the rules of interpretation for parliamentary statutes. Now, parliamentary statutes aren't exactly the same thing as the Constitution, but they did hold a relatively high legal status in the English legal system, kind of like the Constitution does in our legal system. And he articulated rules of interpretation, five of them, that sound a lot like modern originalism. So what do you look at? You look at the text. You look at the context. You look at the purpose. You look at the publicly available context. So the, so the same things that Blackstone was looking at are the things that originalists look at today. And what these two scholars, Wolf and O'Neill, do is they trace that genealogy of these Blackstonian rules, and then they see them operative in the Philadelphia Convention. They see them operative in the, in the, in the ratification debates. They see them operative in the early Supreme Court. So cases like Ogden, uh, versus Saunders, um, McCulloch versus Maryland, and others. I'll give you one, one data point. The Federalist Papers uh, expressly, in some instances, rely on the Blackstone rules of interpretation. So there's Hamilton, Jay, and Madison. They're saying adopt the Constitution. And Brutus, of course, and other anti-Federalists are criticizing the Constitution. In both sides, what you see them using are these conventional rules of interpretation that everybody accepted as the way we interpret our legal system. But, but that were derived from the Blackstonian rules of interpretation. So I think that, that, that the evidence shows that an originalist-like, they didn't use the label, of course, an originalist-like way of interpreting the Constitution was predominant at the time. And I guess I'll just give one more, one more data point. So let's say that you were James Madison Company at the Philadelphia Convention. It's secret. And, and you know that the only thing that the people in the ratification conventions are going to have and that future officers interpreting and following the Constitution are going to have is the text and the publicly available context of the Constitution. And so that suggests to me that, 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 that the people in the Philadelphia Convention had to be um, very um, uh, cognizant of the limited data that they were able to convey to the people in the ratification conventions. And so, and so, so they knew their, what we would call their communicative context was relatively thin, and so they had to leverage very finely the text that they were using, the, the, the conventional rules of interpretation that I mentioned earlier, ter legal terms of art, like writs of habeas corpus and letters of mark and reprisal, which, are, which fill up the Constitution, these legal terms of art, and other things that they knew that were, that were in the context at that time and that the people in the ratification conventions would, would be relying on to interpret. So I think the context also suggests that they were going to use originalism. Eric, do you want to look at the, take this question? Yeah, yeah, I, I saw. I was just going to ask this as well, and I think it ties into your your first outline of of what is common good constitutionalism. Kind of a precedent question to that is 
what is the common good? And, and you've referenced the general welfare from the Constitution's text, and one of our audience members asked about uh, the, you know, the frequent justification for government action, which is the greater good. Is that a synonym to the common good, or, or how, how are they distinct? Yeah, that's a good question. So I, I'm, I'm, I think there's a, a conventional phrase, the greater good. I don't know exactly what that means. I know it means more than the good of one individual. That's, I think, the connotation that I take from it. So I'm not going to um, uh, try to identify what counts as the greater good, but let me talk a little bit about what the common good means, both in the CGC world and in the broader natural law tradition. So the common good in, in the natural law tradition, of which CGC is, is, is a part, and no doubt about it, um, is that it's, it's, the, it's the flourishing of the political community. So, the, so if the political community, if a country is flourishing, then it's securing its common good. How does that relate to the individuals, the members of that political community? There actually, over time, have been developed three different conceptions of the common good within the natural law tradition. And there's a, it's a little bit of kind of, um, maybe maybe hair splitting might be, although I guess in the natural law tradition, you have people like Aquinas who are, are you know purported to do a lot of hair splitting. But there's a little bit of hair splitting going on in the natural law tradition. And there, I think maybe you, the way to think about it is there are these three different conceptions. One is instrumental, which is the common good is the set of conditions that allows the members of that community to flourish. One is um, an individualized conception of the common good. The common good is the good of each individual. And then the third conception is that there's something separate and apart from the individuals in the community that is the common good of the community. And there's and there's debates in the natural law tradition about which is the, the right view. Um, there's actually a great uh, 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 essay by uh, George Duke, a scholar from England, in a uh, in a recent collection, maybe three or four years ago, called the, called Natural Law Theory. And George Duke has an essay that I think is the, is an up to date, state of the art discussion of the common good. And at the end of his essay, he makes the pitch that those three conceptions, in fact, are just three different aspects of one unitary common good. So. So there's the common good, and, and so I've talked about three different conceptions of it. What work does it do in CGC? What work does it do in the natural law tradition? It's the justification for law in the natural law tradition. If a law is advancing the common good, a positive law is advancing the common good, then it has a warrant, it gives people a reason to follow it, and if not, then not. So the common good is the essential, it's the axial point in legal theory from the natural law perspective. One theme throughout your remarks has been the you know the significant overlap between originalism and common common good constitutionalism or at least shared uh, priorities so can, can you highlight a little bit how close you see these two methods of interpretations or theories being and is, is it a, a practical difference or a methodological difference as it as in implementation yeah that's a tough question so as, as i said I'm very interested in common good constitutionals because there are so many aspects of the building blocks of the theory that I think are true. And so I've just been trying to figure out how is what those folks argue different than what natural law originalists have argued. And I, I don't, I, I gave you, I think, three criticisms that they articulate. I think those are genuine criticisms that they articulate. I don't know if there really is, my view is, I don't think there's much space between common good constitutionalism and originalism, at least as I understand it. Uh, both of them, as, as I understand it, uh, are with are, can can flourish within the natural law tradition. Both of them rely on natural law in some instances. Both of them rely on natural law and the common good as a justification for doing the project, for doing CGC, for doing originalism. I have, I'll give you two hypotheses as to areas that I think are continuing differences, uh, and they're just hypotheses. I don't have enough evidence yet to confirm them. So one is when you look at the scholarship, especially of Professor Vermeule, he often characterizes originalism and the original meaning as quote the semantic meaning of the Constitution. Now, what's the semantic meaning? So when you when current originalist theory identifies the Constitution's meaning as its original public meaning, that has three components. One is the conventional meaning of the words at the time. Second, placing those that, that conventional meaning in the context of the document with the rules of grammar and syntax, that would be the semantic meaning. And third, here's the critical, I think, different move that at least so far, CGC folks who are critical of originalism haven't taken on board or haven't recognized, and that is uh, that, that that semantic meaning is in the context of the publicly available uh, information when in the communicative situation. So let's say that we've got um, the semantic meaning for the word. Um, let's pick. Let's pick. Let's pick uh, letters of mark and reprisal. So is there a conventional meaning for the phrase letters of mark and reprisal? I think 
Today in the U.S., the answer is probably no. When I ask my students if they've heard of that phrase, they've never heard of it, most of them. Um, and I think the same was probably true in 1787 and 1789. But there definitely was a meaning of it, right? It was the, the, the legal term of art that was knowledgeable in the discipline of admiralty law. And so, so that publicly available context would, would operate like this. Let's say that you're in the Pennsylvania Ratification Convention. You get the Constitution, and it says Congress can grant letters of mark and reprisal. You say, what is that? I don't know what that is. But you would know, that sounds like a legal term of art. I'm going to ask my lawyer friend over here, James Wilson, who's going to tell me that you look to admiralty law, and under admiralty law, this is what that means. And so the publicly available context is, this is a legal term of art, and you go to the, to the, to the discipline where that legal term of art is identified. And that publicly available context is necessary to actually get the information about what letters of mark and reprisal are. Because otherwise, since there's no, if you agree with me, there's no conventional meaning, or it's at least not widely accessible, then there can't be a, a semantic meaning, which would mean that the original meaning is deeply indeterminate. So I think that's one possible explanation for the differences between them. Um, second, I think, and this maybe is more fundamental. I was actually thinking of this over the last few weeks as we were thinking about this episode. Um, so from the natural law perspective, is it the case that every legal official always and necessarily has to have resort to natural law whenever he or she conducts his or her legal official duties, including interpretation. It seems like the CGC folks want to say yes, that, that, that natural law is always a component of that person's practical reasoning process. What does the law require me to do? How do I carry it out? And what I want, what I want to suggest is that I think the natural law originalist folks are saying something like this. They're saying that as a part of a reasonable determinatio of our legal system, the American legal system, and maybe even most healthy legal systems is, I think, what I would like to argue, that the scope of the office of different officers, judges in particular, is limited. And part of the limitation is that, for at least for federal judges, and I think the evidence bears this out, that one of the things that federal judges have to do is if there's determinate original meaning, they have to follow it. Now, if there's, if there's not determinate original meaning, then I think there's debates about what the judges should do. And so if, you, if that is a determinatio of the office, in other words, if the office of federal judge is limited to, in its focal case, following the determinate original meaning, and if that's a reasonable choice that a legal system can make, and we'll talk about what the reasons would be in a second, then that would suggest that it's just an empirical question whether in our legal system federal judges can take into account natural law when they interpret determinate original meaning. And so why might our legal system do that? You can think of all kinds of reasons. So, for example, John Finnis has an article where he argues, John Finnis being the, the, the preeminent natural law Oxford scholar, where he argues that as a general matter, legislatures or, or elected representatives, popular, popular elected representatives, groups of, groups of lawmakers, they tend to be better at law changing, whereas judges tend to be better at law maintenance, tend, tend to be better at identifying what the law is and applying it. And so if that's true, which again, I think is a prudential judgment, there's lots of arguments in that, but if that was true, that would be a sound reason to say, if the original meaning is indeterminate and we need to create new law in this area of indeterminacy, that should be something that the elective branches do. And if that's a determination of our legal system that's supported by a sound reason, then it seems like at a really deep level, originalism will be consistent with the natural law tradition. But, but, but the CGC folks tend to, seem to be saying, no, you can't do that. A legal system can't make that determinatio. So a little bit of a, of a deep dive there. And so I hope that made some sense. Yeah, yeah, no, it just definitely brings detail to the the general term and 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 different ways to pursue it and discover it. Um, there's a there's a profitable danger in having a well informed audience, and we get to profit by that. Uh, so <laughs> I think you've probably seen the question, but uh, one of our audience members has asked about your point on the fixation thesis and yeah. how that is viewed within common good constitutionalism. So. You, they flag that Vermeule himself in his Atlantic essay and maybe subsequently has has maybe gone back and forth on the fixation thesis. Is there a disagreement amongst common good constitutionalists on that point? Yeah. And, and so I, I don't recall the Atlantic article well enough to know wh what his position was at that point. I know definitively, because I was just rereading it, that he seems to, and again, it's a little bit cagey in the language, so I don't want to oversell this. He seems to say that 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 he agrees, you know, either in the mine run of cases or most cases, I don't know exactly how to characterize it, that uh, with, with the fixation thesis. And the re and there's a reason why Christopher Mill would, 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 I think, be at pains to emphasize this point. So one of the criticisms that's been lodged against common good constitutionalism is that 
hey, this is just living constitutionalism for inter Catholic integralist garb. And so one way to parry that criticism is to say, whoa, folks, hey, we're doing fixation over here as well and constraint. And so, so I think there's a, 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 a line of argument that maybe he developed more recently in the CGC book to try and emphasize the stability and, uh, and, uh, and non-radicalness of CGC. And so that would account then, I think, for the different position in the Atlantic essay, if it was true, which I'm not saying it wasn't, and the, and the CGC book itself. Yeah, an another question from the audience on you know two different veins of tradition, not just classical legal theory, but also the common law tradition that okay. our, our country inherited at the founding. And the question is, you know, the relationship between natural law and rights recognized at common law. Do CGC and originalism treat common law rights and traditions differently from natural law rights and traditions, or? You know, is, is it a mechanism of discovering the same thing? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Or kind of two questions in one, right? So I would say the first part of the question is, what in, with, from the natural law tradition of the CGC folks, which is a classical legal thought, goes back to Rome, what, what place is there for a phenomenon or conception of natural rights? And I would say as a general matter within the natural law tradition, there's a lot, this is a really complicated debate. This is just one person's view is that within the tradition identified by Professor Fabiola and other CGC folks, there is a space for natural rights. Uh, he talks, for example, about the natural right to free speech. He refers to Judd Campbell's excellent scholarship about the natural right to free speech as, an ex as a concrete example of what he's talking about. So I think both he and the natural tradition more generally think of there being space for natural rights. They, te they, tend, to not to, they tend not to be Lockean, libertarian-ish natural rights. Uh, th these natural rights tend to be tied to constitutive aspects of human flourishing. So think about free speech. Free speech isn't the right to say whatever you want, regardless of how it harms other people, either physically or otherwise. Free speech tends to be, free speech is an analytically distinct component of human flourishing, where to be a full flourishing human being, you need to be able to speak with other humans on political matters, on economic matters, and whatever it might be. And so the purpose of the right, the purpose of the of the of the of the free speech, limits the scope of it, at least as a term of theory. And the legal system could modulate it in different ways. So, so my point is, there is a natural rights aspect to the natural law tradition, at least more recently, but it's maybe not the standard one that people are familiar with. Okay, so how does that relate to the to the common law? Different people have different views about the common law. Uh, one view of the common law, which I think is the view that Blackstone held and that many Americans held and that some American scholars continue to hold today, I don't know if the CGC folks do or not, is that the common law is a specification of the natural law, including, this is the point here, including important aspects of natural rights. So I teach property, and so I'm most familiar with that area. There's lots of aspects of American property law inherited from England that provide a really robust scope of discretion and, and autonomy for property owners. And, and we tend to think as Americans that that's, that's basically sound. And I think the natural law tradition thinks that that's basically sound as well. So what does originalism have to say about that? I would say not a whole lot, honestly. Uh, so originalism is about how do you interpret the Constitution? And to the extent the Constitution is referencing the common law, it is it is referencing the common law either, this actually may be a little bit of a debate, either at the time of 1787, 89, or currently. And, uh, and, and how about CGC? I don't know if they have a, a thought out position on the relationship between CGC and, and common law. You could imagine a position something like this. I don't, I don't know that they've taken this position. Since the provisions of the Constitution are relatively indeterminate, and legal interpreters are going to have to have resort to natural law norms to interpret those provisions, some legal, some legal interpreters may want to resort to sub-constitutional law as evidence or data by which to interpret that con that indeterminate constitutional norm. So I, am, I could imagine that being a move that CGC folks have taken. Uh, it's a move that originalists, you know, it's interesting. I guess originalists could take that in areas of underdeterminacy, but when it comes to the focal case where the original meaning is determinate, the originalist judge is not going to have any resort to the common law unless the original meaning says you got to talk to the common law. So, for example, um, the Seventh Amendment is a reference to common law causes of action. So there we've got to. But beyond that, I don't think there's much of a, spite, a space. Maybe a good place to conclude, uh, again, tying back to one of your prior comments, is uh, where else common good constitutionalists have directed critique? And, and you, you mentioned the, the living constitutionalist school. Ha have CGC folks advanced critiques of that methodology, or have they just focused on originalism thus far? 
Yeah. Um, yes. So, so the the the, the, uh, the rhetorical uh, position that CGC scholars have have put themselves in or try to put themselves in is they view on in the in the debates over interpretation. There's there's folks on the other side of the divide. Those are both originalists and living constitutionalists. And then there's folks on, on their side of the divide, the CGC people. So how is how do, how from the CGC folks' perspective? Do they view living constitutionalism? I think at, at a fundamental level, um, the CGC folks view living constitutionalism as being motivated not by the classical legal tradition, in other words, not by sound norms of, of, of natural law, but instead by, and this is their characterization, but instead by a, a progressive desire for liberation, a progressive desire for individual autonomy to the fullest. And one of the cases that Professor Vermeule points to as an example, a negative example in his mind, is a case of Obergefell versus Hodges dealing with same-sex marriage. And so, so I think that's the main critique is a substantive critique. Although I did mention earlier that uh, the CGC folks have been have been concerned about and have been tried to parry any claims that they themselves are uh, just a conservative version of living constitutionalism. There are aspects of, of, of the writing that does support that. So at one, one, at one point, Professor Vermeule describes CGC as, quote, developing constitutionalism. That sounds a lot like living constitutionalism, because what does living constitutionalism do? It purports to take this existing constitution, uh, it may be relatively malleable, and in light of new circumstances, develop the understanding and meaning of that constitution. And CGC perceives itself as, as being committed to the, to the unfolding of the manifold depths of, of the natural law tradition in light of current circumstances. An example would be the administrative state. So the administrative state is a new 20th century phenomenon. And, and CGC is trying to harness that as a creative way to specify what the Constitution's original meaning is. So, so, I, so, there, so they, they do criticize living constitutionalism. Many scholars have identified it. I actually, uh, I, if people are interested, uh, Professor Brian Leiter from the University of Chicago in his review of CGC makes the claim that, that, uh, that CGC is, a, is, is, is hard to distinguish between standard living constitutionalism other than its substantive commitments. Well, thank you very much for that uh, overview of CGC and the, the discussion of how it interacts and, and conflicts with originalism and the natural law. Any any further comments or questions as we close? Yeah, I, I would just encourage our readers. I think this is a really healthy debate. Uh, it's a really interesting debate. So if somebody is interested in the phenomena of natural law and how it plays out in our American legal system, I would read Common Good Constitutionalism. I would read some of the essays by, by folks from that vein. I would also read the, the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy issue because it has a lot of folks from that vein, has a lot of critics from all kinds of perspectives, including originalist perspectives. So I think you'll get a good feel for the debates in there. Yeah, thank you. And, and while they're doing their reading assignments, they'll certainly come across your name <laughs> numerous times. So thank you for, for preparing all of us uh, to, to dive deeper. Um, I hope you all found the conversation profitable and, and useful as you go forward. Please tune in next week, next Tuesday at 8 p.m. for the next episode of Challenges to Originalism, which will be hosted by the UNC Law School chapter. Uh, in that session, Professor Strang will respond to the challenge that, quote, originalism is inconsistent with natural law. Uh, so the ground has been well sown for that, that discussion tonight. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Professor Strang, and good night. Yeah.